Tomorrow night, in a prime time address, President Trump is scheduled to reveal his candidate for the Supreme Court. It's a choice that is widely expected to move the court significantly to the right. It's also a decision that will mark the start of an intense political fight that could help decide which party prevails in the November midterms. But, as special correspondent Jeff Greenfield notes, the Supreme Court as a political battlefield is relatively new. He joins me now from Santa Barbara. Jeff, in recent history, we think of the court nominations as pitch political battles, but you're looking at the longer arc of this. Yeah, it seems almost impossible to, to contemplate, but from 1894 to 1968, only one Supreme Court nominee was rejected. Uh, they were relatively non-controversial. And even when controversy did begin to erupt, they weren't partisan battles. Richard Nixon lost two of his nominees. And in those fights, 17 Democrats voted for Richard Nixon's nominees, 13 Republicans voted against them. And the real surprise to a lot of people is that the most contentious battle over nomination in memory was Clarence Thomas in 1991. He's on the court because 11 Supreme Democrats court. voted for his confirmation. So what changed? In a word, polarization. You don't have any liberal Republicans in the Senate. You don't have any conservative Democrats. The R and the D uh, becomes almost all-encompassing in terms of how you're going to vote and what the base wants to consider. And that's why, for instance, in most recent nominations, for instance, no Republican voted against uh, Neil Gorsuch. I think only uh, four Democrats voted for him. Elena Kagan, Obama's last nominee, only one Democrat voted against her, and like fewer than half a dozen Republicans voted for her. It's all become partisan now in a way it never was before. Was there a nomination in particular? Yeah, I think it, history is going to look back and say that the nomination of David no, Souter I, I in 1990 okay, by the first President Bush was the tipping point. Uh, for I decades, like Republican presidents right. nominated justices who turned out to be very liberal, Earl Warren, William Brennan, Harry Blackman, John Paul Stevens. But when Souter, who was called a home run for conservatives by Bush's chief of staff, uh, went liberal, that was kind of uh, it. The conservative base said, that's it. They had a rallying cry, no more suitors. From here on in, they demanded that any Republican president nominate a justice who'd been vetted by reliably conservative outfits like the Heritage Foundation. And that's been the case, I think, and will be the case, certainly with this president. So let's talk a little bit about the political implications of whoever gets nominated now. Well, right now, uh, there are five Democratic senators up for re-election. They come from states that Trump won by landslide uh, majorities. The president's been campaigning in those states specifically to put pressure on those Democrats to either vote for his nominee or suffer at the polls. And what's interesting is that because the Supreme Court was so much bigger an issue for conservatives who felt uh, betrayed by their presidents uh, than liberals, who are perfectly content to see Republicans nominate moderates and liberals. Among voters who picked the court as their key voting issue in this last presidential election, they broke heavily for Trump. In fact, you could argue that's why Trump is in the White House. And one of the things we're going to see is that the prospect of a very conservative Supreme Court, we're going to find out whether that's going to make Democrats make the Supreme Court as big a voting issue as it has been for Republicans. So there's an enormous amount at stake, whoever uh, the president decides to nominate tomorrow. All right, Jeff Greenfield joining us from California. Thanks so much. Thank you.